United States should symbolize people working together to repair and strengthen our country. The act of coiling and stitching renders strong, sturdy vessels. And as I worked on each piece, I envisioned the healing of this nation and the ripple effect our healing will have on the rest of the world. I was born in 1947, time of great poverty for Black people in Florida in the Deep South. And I was born at home, delivered by a midwife. My name is Vera, V-E-R-A. And that's what I've been called all my life. But the person who delivered me and who filled out my birth certificate spelled Vera, V-E-R-R-I-A. A plague for many Black people in this country is how they came into the world. There's a box on my birth certificate that says if the child is legitimate or illegitimate. And I have the box illegitimate checked on my birth certificate. That means that I am illegitimately here. That means that I was born in this country. My mother wasn't a slave, but her grandmother and grandfather were slaves. And the work that they did to get this country started, slaves did so much of the hard labor from breaking the ground of it, planting the trees, building the houses, hauling all of the wood, plowing the fields, working from sunup to sundown and then some. The pain of looking at my birth certificate, I can't even put it into words. In my family, there are movers and shakers. There have been judges, there have been teachers, lawyers, doctors, policemen, artists, people who gave to the community, like me. I don't have a college degree. My education and my degree is the life that I have chosen to live being in conversation, doing, giving, that's my university. I graduated from Laguna Beach High School, but I didn't go to college. I had two children before I was 22 years old. I had one child, my first child at 19, and my second child at age 21, and I was not married. But I raised those children to be decent, giving human beings. My focus was on the kind of human beings that I'm bringing into the world. Whether you're married or unmarried, bringing a human being into this world, making sure that the work that you put into that human being, that mind, adds to, adds quality, and adds something of worth to the world. As far back as my memory can go to remember the condition of my life, I remember living in Titusville, Florida, early in my life, in a big old raggedy wooden house. The house was so old that it had holes in the floors that you could see through to the ground. It had holes in the, in the roof, in the ceiling, that we would put buckets and pots and pans to catch water that would come in. My mother did the laundry on the back porch, two tubs and a scrub board. And Mrs. Ola would be on her back porch washing and my mother would be on her back porch washing and they would talk through the trees. How you doing, Miss Martha? Oh, I'm all right, Miss Ola, how you doing? Oh, I'm holding on and they'd be washing and talking. I was the youngest child. My mother had three children with the last name of Howard. My oldest sister, Rena, my brother George, who I met when he was dead, and another brother who died at birth. Then she had my sister Jane, whose father's last name was Marlowe. So her name was Jane Marlowe. And my brother Bobby, whose father is white. Bobby is whiter than you. He has freckles, hazel eyes, and he always had light brown, red, sandy hair. My thought was always that my mother was raped. That's a hard thing to say. But my brother was born in 1941. And in 1941, we just didn't have uh, uneducated black women meeting too many white men. So, but he was my brother. Mm -hmm. And he was raised in my home and loved, and he was my brother. Myself and my two sisters, Viola and Victoria, and our father's last name was Moore. My mother never let us use his last name. Upon entering school for the first time, she entered us in school with the last name of Howard, which also caused complications that I had to deal with as an adult. As a child, you don't have control over what your parents do. I accepted him as my father when I became an adult. I held anger towards him all during my childhood because he would make promises to us that he was going to come and bring us things and see us and we would stand in the door and wait for him until the sun disappeared and my mother would pull us out of the door and say he's not coming and we would cry 
you know, and so I held a lot of anger towards him as a child. But when I became an adult and realized that parents are only human beings, I could not hold hatred towards my father once I became an adult. I had to make amends with him and I had to become familiar with him and be, let him know me and let him know my children. And I did that before he died, before he left this world at age 97. I'm thankful that I forgave him. I don't hate him to this day. I learned through my own life that parents are nothing more than children who had children. Parents are nothing more than people who grew up and went through this life as we are, as, as all of us will do, made mistakes, did things that they were sorry for. Some atoned for those mistakes, some didn't. But that's all it is. I didn't want to go through life hating my father. So I chose not to. I chose to be his friend. I chose to help him and give him my help if he needed it. I chose to give him my respect and to have my children give him my respect. And he left this world feeling respected. That's a painful part of my life. And like the people who are rioting in this country are processing pain. Some process it by breaking things, fighting, yelling at TV screen. I choose to process my pain in a way that doesn't poison my soul. Like I said, the work is an individual thing and it's complex. It has many layers because all of the things that are going on today in this country are being done by people who have the same kind of layers that I have. They have personal pain that they have not processed. They have anger that they have not processed. They have trauma that they have not processed. If you bring that baggage to the table, to whatever event you're coming to, whether it's a protest or whether it's a meeting or whether it's a school or a job, it's going to manifest in some way. Things happened to me when I was a small child in Florida, lots of things happened to me. I went through the 50s and the 60s in Florida. I had just turned four. My mother was best friends with a woman. The whole community knew this woman and her husband. Her husband taught at the first school I ever went to, Men's School for the Colored. That's what it was called back then, for the colored. We're colored. <laughs> I mean, just that indignity put upon a person. It was a two-room church building and they put a blackboard between it to divide the small children from the bigger children and our bathroom was an outhouse we had to go outside in all weather to use the bathroom our heat was a pot bellied stove harry t moore and his wife harriet moore were progressive citizens in the town of mims back in the 40s and 30s mr moore was naacp originator in Brevard County back in that time. They touched all of our lives. But Mr. Moore and his wife were murdered in their home while they slept on their silver anniversary on Christmas night because someone placed a bomb under their house and blew it to smithereens while they slept. We felt the explosion. This was when I was four. This is part of the trauma I'm talking about. What I mean when I say we all have layers of trauma, of pain, memory, and if we don't process that the right way, we bring that to all of the things that we participate in, and you're bringing something dangerous. We felt that explosion. I live down the road, but we felt the explosion. Everybody jumped up out of their beds. Some people ran down to the house and saw it. My brother and his friend, Theodis Ray, rode their bikes down to the house the next morning to see the damage, and they couldn't believe it. Evangeline Moore was the last surviving daughter of that couple. She was away from home, which is why she lived, coming home on the train, and she came home to the death of her parents. They had rebuilt her parents' home and turned it into a museum. They did a replica of the home, exactly like it was, and they made robotics of the parents sitting in there. When I went into that museum, into that home, they're still there. Their spirits are still there. I was overcome by their spirits, and I instantly cried. If you go to Florida and visit that museum, you will feel their spirit if you're human. In 2012, at the Florida Historical Society, where Evangeline Moore was going to speak, I immediately knew that I had to speak to her. So I made my way through this crowd of people, and it was so 
amazing because she was sitting there. It was like an aura was shining down on her. I just reached my hand up to her and we came forward to each other like that and clasped hands. And I was just like I am now. And I said, I met your parents. I felt their spirit. And I told her what I felt when I walked into their home. And we cried right there with all these people milling around the room. That was the encounter I had with her. <laughs> so, this is what we carry. You have never seen this. You really didn't know the full volume of my life. And that's just one little tidbit. What do you think made that person bomb the house? Pure hatred. That's all it is. It's a disease. Hatred is more dangerous than Corona. Hatred will take out more people and has taken out more people in this world than any virus that we will ever experience. Hatred is the most dangerous disease that a human being can be consumed by. If you can imagine a person whose only thought and behavior is that of destruction of another human being. How sick is that? If you are consumed by the thought that another human being has no value, so you could step on them. That is the very beginning of life in this country for people of my color. That is a generational disease that has been passed down and taught to young children. I can show you pictures of lynchings where there are families and children drinking beer, eating popcorn, while a man is hanging from a tree. That in itself is the wrong kind of education to implant into a child's mind. There is no need to ask, what can we do? in 2020. It's plain as day what we can do and what we should have been doing all along. But still, even with that horrible fact, you still can't allow anger and hatred and pain to be expelled back out into the world because it's a vicious cycle. Black history from Black viewpoint, it's erased from our history books. When I grew up, we learned about slavery and civil rights and these things, but it just seems like it's really far away from our own reality. When I was living in Baltimore for three years, learning more from the Black community helped me gain an awareness. Like I can relate to some of those emotions, like deaths of really close family friends. But what I've experienced, nothing even close to that. To have it because of your race is a whole nother Love. Oh yeah, we are our own worst enemy. We are self-destructive. We came into this country by force, through no desire of our own, and then we were born here. Slavery was not just done by white people. Slavery was done by many cultures. You can't just say it's white people. it was white people who brought us here. Yeah, if you want to base it just on America, but slavery is a worldwide issue. Put it in a box of this country. They brought us here to be labor to breastfeed their children, to cook their food, to grow their trees, to plant their food, to bring them water, to fan them, to let them rest their feet on our little children's backs as a footrest. Yes, yes, I blame them for that. That's the history of this country. To build the White House, yes, to build a White House that we get beat down in front of. To do all of the things that were easier done by someone else, the overseer who rode the horses and cracked the whip on black people in the field. My cousin was a cotton picker when she was a child. She hates cotton today. My brother, Bobby, who is the, the one who, whose father was the white man, he will not look at watermelon because he was raised as a black man. His daughter, the one I told you I had to talk to yesterday because she's very upset because she's half white. Her mother is white who married my brother. But Emily, she looks white, but she has, her hair can be kinky or straight she can curl it or she can straighten it. But either way, she has blue eyes, darker complexion. She's a mixed child. Her friends want her to decide, well, what are you, black or white? 
she's not going to choose between her mother or her father. And she said that she was so conflicted because her friends are calling her, asking her, well, what can I do? She said, first of all, don't ask me that because I can't tell you what to do. That should be in your heart. So it's a conflicting question for white people and for black people. What is the story behind the watermelon? Watermelon is what we were given to hydrate us so that we can work in the fields from the minute the sun came up and the minute the sun went down. That was our reward. The watermelon is one of the most nutritious foods there is. And the main purpose of that watermelon was to hydrate you so you wouldn't pass out in the sun because you're going to work out there all day. And sometimes you worked out there into the dark. The history of watermelon in pictures is little black pickaninnies with the little plaques all over their heads eating this watermelon so happy. That's the picture that has been turned into memorabilia. We were depicted tar babies eating watermelon throughout history in the books and in comic books, on billboards, in magazines, in movies. So my brother, he will not touch watermelon because he said he won't be a pickaninny for anybody. So many layers. We can talk for years you, and you'll peel back another layer of the onion. And each time you peel back a, a layer of that onion, you'll cry even harder because onions do make you cry. When I reflect on myself, I start embracing who I am and actually yes. like owning that, you know? Like, yes. Um, yes. These are like my cultures. These are the things that make up who I am. Mm -hmm. And then I don't feel so weird. So each one of us is valuable. You know, each one of us has something that we can offer, and that is the strength of our stitch, the strength of our life, the strength of our story.